Now in an atom we have several things. In the nucleus we have protons, we have neutrons, and then all around the outside in shells we have electrons. Now this is a really, really fake drawing because the size of the nucleus is tiny compared to what would be the massive size of shells, but I can't really draw it like that because my screen's not big enough. So what you need to know is that a proton is plus one, neutrons are neutral, and electrons have a minus one charge overall. The atomic number and the mass number tell us lots of bits of information. The atomic number is equal to the number of protons and it is equal to the number of electrons in an atom. The mass number is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So if we wanted to work out the number of neutrons or something, we could just do neutrons equals mass minus atomic. Now there is a lot of maths in this unit. I've written a book that's going to help you through all of the maths if you get stuck on any of these bits coming up. First of all, we're going to look at relative formula mass and you need to use your periodic table to work out how much each of these things weigh. So hydrogen, we have two of them. They weigh one each. We have sulfur. We have one sulfur and it weighs 32. And we have four oxygens and they weigh 16 each. If we add all of those together, we are going to get a mass of 98. If we wanted to work out the percentage of, say, sulfur in this, we would just take the amount for sulfur, which is 32, and divide it by 98, times it by 100 to get our percentage. Now the periodic table has groups and periods on it. The groups are these ones that go down here like this. This is group one, two, three, four, five, six, seven and eight or group zero. And that tells us the number of electrons on the outer shell. So it's really easy and quickly to see that sulfur is in group six. So it is going to have six electrons on its outer shell. We can see that calcium is in group two. So it is gonna have two electrons on its outer shell. Aluminium is in group three. So it's going to have three electrons on its outer shell. Going across, we have the periods. Now, don't forget hydrogen and helium at the top there. One, two, three, four. Now, the periods tell us the number of electron shells. So we can see that magnesium is going to have three electron shells and it's going to have two electrons on its outer shell. We can see that phosphorus is going to have three electron shells and it's going to have five electrons on its outer shell. When we're drawing the electronic arrangement of something, we need to look at the number of electrons and its position on the periodic table. So if we look at calcium, which has 20 electrons, you can see it is in period four and it is in group Two. Now the 20 electrons tells us how many electrons we need to draw, the period tells us how many shells, and the group tells us how many electrons on the outer shell. So here's calcium in the middle, period four, so we need four shells. One, two, three, four. We start filling up from the middle using um, our rules here. So one, two, three, four, 
5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. You'll notice that on the first shell I just put 2, on the second shell I just put 8, on the third shell I just put 8, and now on the fourth shell I'm just going to put 2. That takes us up to 20, and there are 2 electrons on the outer shell. Sodium's atomic number is 11, which means we are going to have 11 protons, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and in an atom, 11 electrons, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Now in an atom with an equal number of protons and electrons, there is going to be no overall charge. If, however, we um, have an ion where we have lost or gained electrons, this electron here is going to go somewhere else, so it's not there anymore. You can see we now have more um, protons than we do electrons, so we have made an ion which does have an overall charge. And depending on how many electrons they have either lost or gained, that will tell you what the charge is. As a really quick rule of thumb, things in group 1 are going to have a plus 1 charge. Things in group 2 are going to have a plus 2 charge. Group 7 are going to have a minus 1 charge. And group 6 are going to be minus 2. Isotopes are different versions of the same element. So here we have hydrogen. And the atomic number of all of these is 1. That tells us it has 1 proton and the proton is the bit that identifies the elements and then if we look at the masses you can see we have a mass of one a mass of two and a mass of three so this tells us that this one here is going to have just one proton this one here has one proton and one neutron and this one here has one proton and two neutrons. Just because we change the number of neutrons something has doesn't change what it actually is. The group one metals are right over on the left hand side of the periodic table and these are also known as the alkali metals. They are group one because they have one electron on the outer shell. And hydrogen is there at the top, but it shouldn't really be there. We're really looking at lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. So the properties of these is as they go down the group, they get more reactive. And when they react with water, they are going to produce a um, salt and hydrogen. And that hydrogen is going to um, be let off as a gas, and then the metal hydroxide is going to turn it alkali, which is where it gets its name from, the alkali metals. Now, if we look at the reasons why it gets more reactive as it goes down the group, here we have lithium with its three electrons, and then potassium fourth period, so it's going to have four shells. Now, this electron here on the outside is the one that is given away or the one that runs away when something reacts. And we have this positive charge in the middle in the nucleus here. And this positive charge is holding on to this electron, holding on for dear life to this electron, but this electron wants to run away. Now, in lithium, there's not a lot of distance between the positive charge and the electron. So lithium has quite a tight hold over it, whereas in potassium there's lots of distance, there's lots of shells in the way getting in between the positive nucleus and the electron that's trying to escape. So it's actually quite hard for potassium to hold on to this electron, so it loses it quite easily. And because it loses it quite easily, it makes it more reactive. Now the technical 
useful term for these electrons getting in the way is shielding. Group 7 is over on the far right hand side of the periodic table and these are also known as the halogens. Now unlike group 1, the most reactive ones are at the top. These are generally found as diatomic molecules, which means you are going to get F2 and Cl2 because um, they like to hang around with each other. Now they have seven electrons on that outer shell and we can use this to explain their properties. So if we look at fluorine, and then compare that to chlorine. So what fluorine and chlorine want to do is to fill up this extra space they have in there and the positive charge in the middle needs to be pulling things in but the problem is is all these electron shells in the way getting in the way of pulling it in so for fluorine to reach out and pull something in it only has to go through one shell whereas chlorine has to go through two shells to pull things in making it harder for chlorine to pull things in than fluorine to pull things in and the harder it is to pull things in the less reactive it's going to be so again the technical term for this is shielding chlorine has more shielding so it is less reactive because it is harder to pull electrons in The exam board is going to expect that you know the test for ions and it's not just going to be something as simple as what colour does this go in a flame test, they're probably going to want you to play detective. Now some of these colours might seem a bit unusual but these are the colours that the exam board would like you to call them. So lithium goes crimson, sodium, yellow, potassium is a lovely lilac colour, calcium goes red, notice different from the crimson of lilac, and barium goes green, even though it's basically impossible to see in the lab. The other tests for positive ions that you need to know are the reactions with sodium hydroxide, And you need to know that copper 2 will give a blue precipitate, iron 2 will give a green precipitate, and iron 3 will give a brown precipitate. Now this is sometimes hard to see in the lab, but don't worry about what you see in the lab because this is what the exam board wants to see. As well as positive ions, you need to know how to test for negative ions. So testing for carbonate is if we add an acid, it should fizz, and then the fizz should be carbon dioxide, which should turn lime water cloudy. Halides, there are three different halides um, that you need to know. First thing we need to do is to add dilute nitric acid. Then we need to add silver nitrate. And chlorine ions will go white. Bromide ions will go cream and iodide ions will go yellow. Again in the lab these colours are very very subtle to see but this is what the exam board would like you to write. The last thing we need to do is to test for sulphate ions. You need to add dilute hydrochloric acid and then barium chloride. And if sulphate ions are present then you'll get a white precipitate formed. Ionic 
bonding occurs between a metal and a non-metal. So something that is on the right hand side of the periodic table and something that is on the left hand side of the periodic table. If we use sodium chloride as an example, here we have sodium with one electron on the outer shell and chlorine with seven electrons on the outer shell. What is going to happen is this electron here is going to go over there because everything wants to have a full outer shell. And what we are going to end up with afterwards in square brackets is chlorine and sodium having a full outer shell. Chlorine with its seven original electrons and then the extra one it has gained from sodium. Now because sodium has lost an electron it is going to have a positive charge and because chlorine has gained an electron it is going to have a negative charge. Metals are going to form positive ions and non-metals are going to form negative ions. And between these positive and these negative ions, they are going to build up this massive, massive lattice. And there are going to be really, really strong bonds in between them. There are very, very strong attractions. And because they have such strong attractions, this leads to their properties. So the properties are that they are going to have high boiling points, because you're going to need a lot of energy to separate out these things, high melting points. When they are a solid, they are not going to conduct electricity. But they are going to conduct when molten or dissolved. And the reason they're only going to conduct when they're molten or dissolved is because this is when the ions are going to be free to move around. Covalent bonding is going to happen between non-metals. And this is sharing of electrons. Now there are a few common ones the exam board will expect you to know. This is hydrogen chloride. What you need to do is have your overlapping circles. Chlorine has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons, and then one from hydrogen. Make sure you have your overlapping circles and you draw your um, electrons in the middle. Methane, which is CH4. And carbon is going to have one, two, three, four, and then each of the hydrogens gives one water, which is going to have an oxygen in the middle, hydrogens either side, one, two, three, four, five, six from oxygen, and then another two from the hydrogens, and ammonia, which is NH3. So we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three. These are the simple molecules the exam board expects you to know about and expects you to be able to draw. When we're talking about simple covalent molecules, the exam board expects you to know the properties of them. So these are going to have low melting points, low boiling points. They do not conduct electricity. And they are generally going to be a gas or a liquid at room temperature. When we're talking about giant covalent structures, the example the examples gives are diamond, which is made of carbon, and silicon dioxide. Now you need to know the properties of these, and the properties are that they have high melting and boiling points. And they do not conduct electricity.
diamond and graphite are two examples of structures that are made purely from carbon, but diamond is going to make four bonds and graphite is going to make three bonds. So diamond, as I mentioned before, is hard, it is strong, it has higher melting points and boiling points, whereas graphite is in layers. Now, layers can slide, which means it is soft. And in between these layers, there are this extra electrons. So they have free electrons. So they can conduct. Two really common ways of measuring a rate of reaction are looking for a colour change, so in sodium thiosulfate looking for it to go cloudy, or um, in the iodine clock looking for it to go black, or collecting gas. Now you can collect gas by um, inverting a measuring cylinder over a washing up bowl full of water, or you can measure the loss of gas by putting on a scales and watching the mass go down, or you can use a gas syringe. So there are lots of different ways that you can actually watch a rate of reaction as it is happening. You can watch for a colour change and if you wanted to improve that you could use something like um, a data logger um, and to actually measure the colour change or the cloudiness as it was going along. Or you can just measure the gas collected over a certain period of time or over a certain, like over the whole experiment. <laughs> There are several parts of collision theory you need to know about. We're going to start with temperature. So there are two important things you need to know about temperature. How fast they're moving and whether there is a successful collision or not. Now things that are moving slowly around aren't really going to be doing very much. They're kind of just lazily wandering around. So they're not going to find each other as quickly. And when they bump into each other, they might just go, meh and then wander off in the opposite direction. Whereas things that are whizzing around really, really quickly in lots and lots of different directions are much more likely to first of all bump into each other and then when they bump into each other there is much more likely to be a reaction that takes place. So two things, the frequency of collisions and the number of successful collisions. When we're talking about concentration or pressure, because in this circumstance we can treat them the same, it's a low concentration, there aren't very many particles around, so it doesn't matter how fast they're moving, if they can't find another particle to collide with, to react with, they're not going to react. At a high concentration, when there are lots and lots of particles around, it is much more likely that they are going to find something to collide with and thus have a successful collision. Now, a catalyst doesn't actually get involved with the reaction, it will just speed it up. So in our uncatalyzed reaction over here, all of the particles are whizzing around all over the place. It's very, very hard for them to bump into each other and react. Whereas with our catalyst, they are stuck in one place. So if something was to whiz along and bump into them, instead of in the uncatalyzed reaction, whizzing along and maybe bumping into this one, whizzing along, it's much easier for it to bump into the catalyst because the catalyst is a lot bigger. Now surface area is tricky to understand because the smaller the particles, so if something is powdered as opposed to in a lump, this is going to have a larger surface area. Now, only the things on that outside can collide. So in the lump, there is only 10 different particles available to collide. Whereas here, all of them can react with other things because they're all spread out. So they have a larger surface area. Crude oil is a big, thick, gunky mixture that we dig out of the ground and it is a mixture of different length, hydrocarbons. Now a hydrocarbon is something that is made of hydrogen 
plus carbon only. Fractional distillation is a process where we separate out all the different lengths of the hydrocarbons that come in crude oil. So here is a fractional distillation column and we heat up the crude oil and it goes in here. And it works its way up until it finds its condensing point. Now at the top here we are going to have short chains. And at the bottom we are going to have long chains. And these have very, very different properties depending on how high they are, or how long they are, sorry. So short chains are going to have low boiling points, and long chains are going to have high boiling points. The short ones are going to be very volatile, and the long ones are not going to be very volatile. The long ones are going to be very thick and viscous. That's like honey, so really, really hard to pour. Whereas the short ones are generally going to be gas, so they're going to be very, very runny, so that's going to have very low viscosity. The short ones are going to make good fuels and are going to be very flammable. Whereas the long chain ones are not going to be flammable. When we are looking at alkanes, we need to think about breaking the name into two parts. The first part will tell us the number of carbons. And the second part will tell us the type of bonding. Now in an alkane, we are only going to have single bonding. Now I've put a little reference table up over here so we can check how many um, carbons we have. So if we look at the first one, if we look at methane, the first part of the name, meth, tells us it's going to be one carbon, and the second part of the name tells us it's going to be single bonding. Now when we are drawing um, hydrocarbons, carbon makes four bonds, and hydrogen only makes one bond. So here we have methane. If we were then going to move on to draw ethane, that has two bonds, you draw carbon, carbon, each carbon has to make four bonds. Hydrogen, use that to fill in all the gaps, that can only make one bond. And so on all the way up to hexane. Alkenes are very similar to alkanes, but we can see that the ending of the name is ever so slightly different, and this has double bonds. It doesn't matter, unless there are numbers in there, which they may do, but they might not do, um, where that double bond goes. So we can't have methane because we need to have a double bond between two carbons. So if we look at propene, Carbon, 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 we need a double bond. Carbon can make four bonds, so the first one already has one, two, three, four. Second one already has one, two, three, four. One in there, two, three, four. And because it's a hydrocarbon, only has hydrogen and carbon in, so we can fill the rest up with hydrogens. If we were going to go on and draw butene, one, two, three, four um, carbons, double bond, doesn't matter where it goes, four on that one, four on that one, four on that one, four on that one. This can be quite confusing and I do have lots of other videos on this topic if you want to see more videos about drawing this. But most of the time they will give you a scaffold to fill in. The most important thing to remember is to work out whether it's single bonds or double bonds and to remember how many thing bonds um, carbon and hydrogen make.
Now remembering whether it's a double bond for an alkene or an alkane can be quite complicated, but a good trick is to look at the number of E's. So an alkane has one E, so it's going to have single bonds, and an alkene has two E's, so it's going to have a double bond in there. If we want to test if something has a double bond, we need to add bromine water. And if a double bond is present, it will go from orange to colourless. They love asking about this test. It is really, really worth learning it. Um, Every year, every other year, it comes up in the examiner's report that people get this test wrong. So please learn this one. If we want to harden an oil, if we want to go from something that is unsaturated, so it has double bonds, to something that is saturated, so it only has single bonds, what we need to do is to add in hydrogen gas. It needs to be done at 60 degrees and you need a nickel catalyst. And what will happen is this double bond here will break and we will get our original um, part of ethene and then the hydrogen will just pop in there, hardening or hydrogenating the double bond. Here we have ethene. We know it's ethene because there are two carbons and anything that has two carbons in is an eth and we know it's an ene because it has this double bond in here and this is a monomer. Now monomer just means one bit. Now what we can do is polymerize this and make a polymer. Polymer just means poly, lots of bits. So we go from one bit to lots of bits. And what happens here is one of these double bonds breaks and its arms stretch outwards. The hydrogen stay in the same place. And we draw square brackets around it. And we put a little N after it and a big N in front of it. Now, sometimes they might give you something else instead of four carbons. That's okay, don't worry, just treat it exactly the same way as this. Break that double bond in the middle and stretch it outside and then just draw everything else exactly the same as you see it. Now, when we're polymerizing something, all we do to change the name is put poly in front of it. So this is polyethene. Plastics as polymers are incredibly useful things and there are two different types you need to know about, thermosetting and thermosoftening. Now thermosoftening polymers are all these mixed up chains, they are just tangled together. Thermosetting have these cross links. which means their properties are going to be a lot different. When we um, have these cross links, it is going to be rigid and it is going to be heat resistant, which is means it's gonna be the type of plastic that's gonna burn when you heat it, whereas thermosoftening is just going to melt. By the time you get this far in the course, the examiner's going to expect that you can balance equations perfectly. So here is a particularly tricky one for us to practice on. We have aluminium, M N O A L M N O. We have one, we have one, we have two, we have two, we have one, we have three. So the first thing I'm going to do is put a two in front of there. That gives me two there. Um, now, because I have an of an oxygen, so I have an even number on one side and an odd number on the other side, what I'm going to do is just put a two in front of there um, just to make my numbers even, because even numbers are much, much easier to work with. That gives me a four, that gives me a six, which means I need to change that one there into a four, that gives me four. Um, then I need to get some more oxygen, so let's get rid of that, let's pop a three in front of there. I have three of those, I have six of those, let's pop a three in front of there, and I have three of those. 
if you cannot balance that equation, um, and I know it's a particularly tricky one, but the examiners are going to throw particularly tricky ones at you. So if you can't balance that sort of equation, you need to practice. Um, I suggest you pop over to my website where I've just published a book which includes loads and loads of equations for you to balance. This is another maths bit that's just for the higher tier students. And I think this is potentially one of the trickiest things in there. It's reacting masses. So we need to work out how much hydrogen peroxide we're going to produce if we have eight grams of oxygen. Now, the way that I do this is to start out by working out the masses of everything. So oxygen, we have two of those and they weigh 16 each. That weighs 32. Over here, we have um, two times hydrogen, they are one each, so that is two. Two times oxygen, they are 16 each, so that is 32, giving us 34, and we have two of them. So that is going to give us 68. So we know that if we had 68 grams, rather we know 68 grams would be produced from 32 grams of hydrogens, and now we can just treat this as a ratios question. What we need to do is 8 divided by 32, that is going to give us 0 0.25. We can then take that and times it by 68 over here. So 68 times 0 0.25 is going to give us 17 grams. Loads, loads more examples again in my book. More maths here, and again, just for higher tier, but this is actually really, really nice because it's just a simple division. To work out the percentage yield, you need to look carefully in the question, work out how much was actually produced, and just divide that by theoretically how much should have been produced. Now, they could ask you why um, the, the, the maximum amount wasn't produced, and this could be because it is a reversible reaction. And the symbol for a reversible reaction is just these little backwards and forwards half arrows. So here we have exothermic and endothermic reactions. And in an exothermic reaction, we are going to have our reactants. And then our products are going to be down here. In an endothermic reaction, our reactants are down here. and then our products are up here. If a catalyst is used, what you are going to see is reactants hump down to products. Now, this hump is just the activation energy. Endothermic and exothermic are very complicated words for gets cold and gets hot. And if we think about this in terms of energy, so if we say something is exothermic, it gives out heat. And something that is endothermic takes in heat. If we want to make this a bit more sophisticated and talk about energy, we can just replace the word heat with energy. So something that is endothermic takes in energy and something that is exothermic gives out energy. We can use chromatography to separate out substances. What we have down here is a solvent, that's the um, mixtures, the substances dissolve in, and then they move up through the paper. Here we have a pencil start line, and it has been penciled because otherwise um, the pen would dissolve in the solvent and then you would just get a massive smear. But I quite like chromatography because it's pretty. Other ways of separating things out are gas chromatography. So you feed a sample into an oven where it gets heated up and turned into a gas. It will then get fed into a computer 
and the computer will tell you what things are. Mass spectrometry will um, separate things based on mass unsurprisingly based on the name and what you'll get is lots of different peaks depending on the size of something. Now these modern techniques are better than previous techniques um, because they're very accurate, they are sensitive, um, they are quicker, you can use small amounts, so you don't have to have loads to be um, analysed. But the disadvantages are that they are expensive and um, a special lab needs to do them. Water contains a surprising amount of chemistry. So there are two different types of water you need to know about. You need to know about hard water and soft water. Hard water is going to have group 2 compounds dissolved in it. So that's going to be calcium or magnesium. And soft water just doesn't. And the place that it gets these um, group 2 compounds is when it rains the water then trickles through limestone rocks and out the other side. So when it's dissolving, when it's going through the rocks, it um, dissolves in there and then that turns the nice soft water into hard water. When the magnesium calcium ions in hard water react with soap, we are going to get scum that is the stuff that you know when you're washing hands sometimes you can see the foamy stuff that is the scum if we heat it up that is when we're going to get scale so this is lime scale now hard water might not sound very good but there are some advantages to it it is very good for your teeth and bones because it has lots and lots of lovely um, minerals in there, lots and lots of lovely calcium in there. It is also good at preventing heart disease. There are a number of ways we can remove hardness. So we have two types of hard water, temporary hard water and permanent hard water. And temporary hard water can just be um, made soft by heating it. And that is going to lead to lime scale in the bottom of our kettles, which can then um, hurt the way that the kettles work and potentially break them. Permanent hard water cannot be removed just by boiling it. So you have to do two things. You can also do this to um, temporary hard water to remove it. You can use soda. So washing soda or soda crystals, that is going to soften the water. Or you can use an iron exchange column, which will replace the group 2 ions with something like a group 1 iron. Well done for making it to the end, guys. That was quite a long video, a bit of a hard slog there. Um, good luck for your exams. If there's anything you need, just let me know and I'll do my very, very best to help you out.